there is this complete other side to the sex trade that the left is still not looking at. The business model of a lot of these big porn companies. If you can get a kid's mind between four and adolescence, you've got a customer for life. This is how they hook the kids in. Hello, I'm Julie Bindle, and this is Action Men, a series in which I have interesting conversations with men that actually get up off their backsides and contribute to the work that feminists are doing to prevent rape, domestic violence, and challenge pornography and the sex trade. My guest for this week is Pala Melissa. I read an article he'd written where he described prostitution as oppressive and unacceptable. And for that, he was roundly punished. Here's Pala. Pala, it's so good to speak to you. It's been a long time since we last had a conversation. And I'd just love you to tell everyone who you are and how you got to where you are today. Well, I'm from Vanuatu. I've lived in New Zealand for um, most of my life. I did my PhD in accounting for sustainable development. And then in 2018, I ended up retraining in body-mind therapy, psychosomatics. And, you know, Julie, we talk about the importance of um, radical honesty in, in the political realm when it comes to dealing with topics like sexual exploitation and discrimination and inequality. The thing I realized in 2018 was it's in some ways even more primary to have that honesty in our own personal lives. I mean, really, that's been the feminist injunction to make the personal, the personal is the political. Um, I had to come to that realization the hard way by going through burnout. Um, but it's been one of the best things that I've also gone through because it's really got me uh, aware of just how important the emotional work of and and really the less glamorous work eh, of like making sure our relationship with the most important people in our lives is actually good and complete and has integrity. And that's something that you've written about and spoken out about in the past, haven't you? Because I came across your work in 2015 with a brilliant essay that you wrote in um, in an online magazine about breaking the silence on prostitution and rape culture, where you also spoke about the elements of racism and colonialism and imperialism inherent to the system of prostitution that the left would not address. I mean, we knew that they wouldn't address, the male left wouldn't address the abuse that came from the misogyny involved. But you spoke very eloquently about what white men do to women of colour and indigenous women and black women um, and and yet seem to get a kind of free pass for that. Can you tell me what led up to you writing that essay? Yeah, well, I started off, so my mother was a, a long time, um, uh, a, a long time uh an outspoken advocate of women's rights in, in Vanuatu and, and within and throughout the Pacific. Um, and I kind of, I grew up listening to her give these speeches. Um, at, but it wasn't until I got to, and this was in the 70s and 80s, so mum and dad were both um, part of that leadership corps that took Vanuatu to independence against the British and French. Um, in the 1970s, and Vanuatu became independent in 1980. And so what mum experienced growing up was, uh, with me growing up watching mum, was this experience of fighting alongside my dad and the other men in that decolonization struggle, only to go into power after independence, and then to see the men systematically push the women aside from all the top political positions that were quite available to them. And mum um, mum basically didn't let them get away with it. And she mobilized, you know, all their resources to 
call attention to that inequity within Vanu- Ni Vanuatu indigenous culture, which didn't make it very popular. You know, we had our house burned down and her, you know, mum, you know, endured quite uh, quite strong forms of backlash over the years. Really? And, and yeah, and, and, you know, just seeing her example of never backing down, it, it stayed with me as a boy. And it wasn't until I got to university and when I started my PhD, really, and I really started deep diving into the history of feminism, not just within the Pacific, but worldwide. And that's when I started to pick up that there are these, you know, I, I tend to see life as it, it really is a real thing that our 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 histories and not just our political histories, they go through these cycles of 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 consciousness raising and huge breakthroughs at the societal level and at the cultural level. And then it's kind of like a pendulum swing and then conservative forces is a backlash that comes against them. And then there's this thing of cultural amnesia and this erasing of that history that takes place. So when I was reading, uh, you know, I would, I did my PhD in the mid two thousands. So even back then, a lot of the erasure of some of the early radical critiques of, patriarchal culture that Pacific feminists were putting out in the 70s and 80s. No one really knew about them. You know, the the political amnesia at school, at university level, also said it. And so those first generation radical feminists, and I'm talking indigenous radical feminists, um, a lot of, you know, they were almost unknown at university level. Because even at Vic at the time, for instance, women's studies had shut down. I think gender studies, if it wasn't shut down by then, was on the way out. So you could see how the intellectual climate quite closely uh, correlated with the political shifts at the social level, at the societal level. So one of the points that I really tried to do with my, my writing was just to do my best to bring back and to call attention that, hey, there's actually these older critiques that in a lot of ways are actually asking really relevant questions for understanding the political situation now when it comes to looking really deeply and honestly at some of the darker aspects of patriarchal culture that we don't tend to talk about that much such as the sex industry such as prostitution and pornography what's your take on the kind of the role that pornography plays in the sex education quote unquote of our young people right now are you talking about that where you are when you think about um how our sexuality gets formed over time from growing up that sexual drive is itself such a powerful shaper of human psychology because of it's it's deeply tied to the needs, the fundamental drives of the human body um, or, or the body mind, as I like to call it, because it you can't really separate body from mind. Um, and because it's got that deep rooted um, embeddedness in in the body mind system. You know anything that can that can shape um, our our the human psychology in that fundamental way by linking it to the sex drives, um, and of course, if you look at the research that's coming out, and actually that's been around for a while, of how companies, especially tech companies, and some of the biggest companies in the world, it's actually part of their model to consciously target. The, the 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 formation of our our children's mental development right as because, they used to you know, with with cigarettes with the tobacco the tobacco industry did exactly the same that's right and and the principle is you know if you can get a kid's mind between zero and four 
And of course, in the formative years between four and adolescence, you've got a, cons- a customer for life. You've got a loyal customer for life. And of course, if you have a look at the business model of a lot of these big porn companies, um, they've actually had as part of their business model the offering of free porn because, of course, kids don't have disposable income. But of course, every kid, but you know, every kid's got iPhones now, right? Especially in the Western world. So if you can offer that kind of access to your kids and you start shaping their own predispositions of what turns them on, say, sexually, you've got a customer for life. Right. And of course, part of the dopamine, and we're getting into the nitty gritty of, say, the, how the, the human mind forms these these addictions and attachments it's that dopamine cycle if you can get addicted to a certain dopamine hit in order to maintain its effectiveness you've got to ramp up the stimulus and that's why a lot of these porn companies too they feed in these layers of feeding peak consumers more and more degrading and violent forms of pornography right because, because the the kids and then the young men get almost immune to what they've been seeing they want something harder they want something nastier and you're absolutely right gail dines the scholar who now runs culture reframed she's a brit who's lived in in boston for for decades and she wrote pornland brilliant book where she outlines this business model where she looks at the fact that the porn industry is about money not sex. These men are turned on by money. And of course, as you've outlined eloquently, this is how they hook the kids in. Pepsi and Coca-Cola did it. Why wouldn't the porn industry use that? The tobacco industry used it. And Gail told me a fascinating story about this where she went to interview some men in prison who had committed acts of rape and sexual assault against underage girls and boys. So kids. And she talked to them about why and how and what was in their mind at the time. I think we've got to do this stuff. We've got to talk to these men about where were they at the time that they did that. And one man said to her, porn groomed me. I mean, yeah, maybe he was trying to kind of get himself absolved of responsibility, which of course he would not, he cannot. But there's something in that, that that porn actually gave him the blueprint of how this works. One of the problems we've got in our public discourse at the moment is most of the politics of public discourse are built on the politics of shame and blame. Now, now from a, from a psychological standpoint, like you think about this, Judy, like just think about it in terms of our, our own families and kids and our own relationships. Like, you try to get somewhere by blaming and shaming your partner. Forget right? it, all yeah. Your, all your kids. Now, now it like, blame, blaming and shaming is distinct from holding someone responsible and accountable. Those are two very different things. But if you look at most of our political discourse around these issues, most of it, if you really look closely, and and it's really a individual by individual thing. Look at how someone communicates across, especially across political aisles. And when people get worked up emotionally, and you lose the the respect, the respect goes out of your speech, and the name calling comes in. And actually, Julie, it's in both sides. Uh you can't get into someone else's world if you're already if you've already got these these conclusions in your mind and someone's just uh, a complete enemy that you can't actually see each other's common humanity and and again recognizing someone else's humanity doesn't mean we absolve anyone of responsibility and accountability I agree. And in fact, this is exactly what Gail Dines says in her approach in Culture Reframed, the NGO that she runs, 
which is focused on talking to parents of teens and preteens who are either consuming porn or are definitely vulnerable to consuming porn in a way that means the parents can then take that message to their kids without being anti-sex, without shaming them, without saying that what you're doing is dirty or bad or wrong. The opposite of that, because as we know, this is the last way that we're going to get through to kids. And it's also the same for adults. And, and actually you have been, I would say, these aren't your words, it's my words, a victim of a kind of cancel oh. culture. Yeah. I, um, yeah, that was a real learning experience for me. Um, specifically, it, it, it made me become really aware of, you know, every, every community, even activist communities, um, we've all got these collectively held beliefs, which kind of imposes certain boundaries around what can be said and uh, what cannot be said and what's speakable and what's completely unspeakable. And just as a, as a consequence of how political histories unfolded throughout the decades from the 70s with, the, with that right-wing backlash that came in, um, and then the, you know, the, the sexual liberalization of culture um, that started to mainstream uh, pornography and prostitution, that the sex industries, um, yeah, you couldn't ask questions about, uh, well, it, is, there a, is there a darker side to, to the sex trade? Is it, is it undergirded by these material conditions like homelessness and 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 violence and trafficking and and child trafficking and so forth that that we don't like really looking at or talking about because it brings up kind of like the the collective hypocrisies that we that makes it hard to acknowledge as part of our our collective identity. So me writing articles that simply started not just calling attention, but literally kind of pointing at that sore. Um, yeah, people generally don't react well to that when their own political positions and political identities are in a lot of ways premised on the acceptability of things like the sex trade. Um, having said that too, Julie, I... You know, I've I've also been, I've also learned and and done my own self reflection, and you know, um, and one of the things I've realised is if I if I was really honest, Julie, and I looked at my own way of communicating my ideas and 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 speaking out, um, there was a condemnatory tone to my um, to my voice. Um, and again, if 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 I if I did it again now, and and my my stance at the moment, I I'd still I'd still claim that my God, there is this complete other side to the sex trade that the left is still not looking at, that hardly any of our activist groups across the spectrum are willing to look at. I'd also say it's really important when we look at these issues and we also engage with other people, especially across the political aisle, that we're also really cognizant of people's sovereignty and free choice. Now, when you put those two things next to each other, it's often a bit hard to see how you can marry the two together. You know, like, and people tend to flip flop. You're, it's either, you know, it's completely oppressive, this structure, and there's no freedom, or or there's freedom, but now you're just this complete, um, uh, you know, liberalistic uh, person who doesn't know a bar about what structural inequality is all about. I think both those two positions are self-defeating, and they're actually false choices. I so think in other words, it, you... 
you can't deny that there is some agency or some choice that's exercised rather than us imposing uh, something on women, for example, and saying, no, I don't accept this. You are not choosing to be in the sex trade. Something which I would never say to a woman because I'd be telling her she's either a liar or she's got false consciousness. But at the yes. same time, challenging the notion that freedom and choice can come out of a life so restricted by social class, racism, and patriarchy, poverty. Feminism has become fractured. And the way that I sometimes will say, will explain what I mean by splintered and fractured is a way that is clearly, I hope, humorous, which is that there are hundreds of ways to be a feminist, but most of them are wrong. And that uh -huh. there is something which is a kind of a basic feminism with basic principles about overcoming patriarchy and starting from the bottom up. So caring about the women in the basement, not the women in the glass ceiling more. Well. But tell me what you think about feminism as a political movement today, right now. Looking um, from your point of view into that movement, what's your thoughts? Man, great question, Julie. So when I look at the present state of contemporary feminism, um, especially when I compare it historically to say, I mean, Julie, I don't even know what wave we're up to. If we've gone through, let's say, five or six waves of feminism, and each of them are actually historically and culturally distinct. There's a continuity across these these ages or phases, right? First gen and then radical feminism in the 70s. I would say, looking back on it and describing it against third wave and fourth wave feminism is one of its strengths was it was a directness to its critique of patriarchy and the structural critique is probably something that's unmatched, especially by the way it was able to connect multiple uh, vectors of oppression, I'll put it that way, from colonization and imperialism to that close, finally focused look at um, the realm of sex itself and intercourse and sexuality where these institutions like pornography and prostitution really got put under the microscope. Then the third and fourth wave comes along and they started losing a lot of that really direct critique of structure. What they introduced though was uh, in some ways actually need, a much needed also injection of um, let's call it multiplicity and the recognition of cultural diversity and difference. Now, that's a strength of theirs as well. But at the same time, both, both, and I'm, I know I'm drawing a simple polarity, like I'm not trying to reduce the nuance, but what I'm saying is both those positions had strengths and both those positions also had blind spots and lost something. And I think in order to develop a feminist, you know, just speaking for myself, in order to develop a critique of um, current power structures now, it really requires a conscious effort to address biases on, where, on both, wherever they, they happen to be and actually to get away from this in fighting amongst ourselves. It's an ideological war and it's intergenerational and it's cross-generational between different factions of women, all of whom are feminist, all of whom say we want to end patriarchy. And there's so many different ways in which we can't connect to each other and reasons why we can't connect to each other. And my, my goal, my aim, the thing that I would, if I could wave a magic wand, I would have this one wish granted, is that we get in a room together and talk, especially with younger women who feel disconnected from older feminists who think that we're irrelevant or who think that porn and prostitution is now empowering 
or who deny their own abuse because they've been told it gives them agency. And at the same time, we, you know, because I'm very much from the second wave, we are losing the ability to talk with younger women and acknowledge their reality and acknowledge how they have come to their own conclusions about their lives. And at the same time, Pella, I want to ask you, it's a kind of final question for you, is how do we get young men, men of all ages, but in particular young men, to recognise that the struggle for women's liberation should be something that they have a stake in? How do we encourage them and enable them to do the work, to speak amongst themselves about male violence and go through that educational process that you've been through? Because they might mm. not, they don't have mums. Most of them don't have mums like the mum you had. Yeah. The thing that I've found is it, it's not that effective to connect to kids, much less boys, if, if at the moment we open our mouth, we're asking them to step into our world. Right, it's like we've got these political answers and they just need to get with the program. I mean, you know, like, you know, that just that doesn't work with our own kids, for goodness sake. Why do you think it would work as a political strategy? Right. Yeah. Good point. Right? The way to connect with our kids is forget the polit forget the political issues. Like we'll get to them. Take the time to un to, to get into their world. And actually to, to, to be in their world with them. Man, we do that. They'll tell us stuff that will knock our socks off. I, I, I think, found that. I, think, I found I that with girls. I think that's one of the biggest blind spots we've got at the moment. And like I'm generalizing. Um, there's some amazing work being done. I, I'm making a general point, though, that if you look, historically about how we've tried to quote unquote change the world uh i think we've got about it back to front i won't use the cruder commonwealth way of putting it a eh? but you know ask backwards <laughs> uh you know but if, if you start by by getting wanting to really get to know our young people Man, I think that's more than half the battle. Because when a kid feels God, man, they'll tell you stuff you won't even know about or expect. And that's actually the basis of building a truly uh, empowering movement that actually includes everyone. Paula, thank you. You've been the best, best guest. <laughs> <laughs>